some more good news. Y'all sing with us. Y'all know this.
Good morning, and welcome to First Christian Church. We're so glad that you are here this morning, and we hope that you'll hear a word today or hear a song that will touch you in a special way. I was thinking about what to say this morning, and the word change kept coming to mind, and I thought, wow, it's the changing of the seasons. It's time for school to go back. There's a lot of change in life that's inevitable. I'm not personally a big fan of winter, so as much as I pray for winter not to come, it's going to come anyway. So I might as well embrace winter and find the beauty that winter does often provide us during that season. I often think about change in life can be good, change in life can be scary, but change is inevitable. And I've been going through a lot of change at work, we're going through an integration, I'm trying to keep our old world going and a new world going and figuring out what next direction is going to be in, whether you're taking a new job, you're starting a new school, you've got a health report, something that's changing your life. There's one thing that is unchanging, and that's God. Amen. God is unchanging. And it made me think, and of course, being a musician, everything has a song. I hear a scripture, I think of a song. That's the first thing I go to. So I thought about that old gospel song, Hold On to God's Unchanging Hand. Time is filled with swift transition. None on earth and move can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal, and then you hold on to God's unchanging hand. Trust in him who will not leave you. Whatsoever the years may bring, when your earthly friends forsake you, still more closely to him cling. Mm -hmm. So rise as you're able, and let's come to the cross. That is never changing, is our ability to come to God any time in our time of need. One, two, three, four. Y'all know this now, so sing out.
here and I invite you all to pray and this week will be no exception but sometimes when I stand up here and invite you all to pray I feel very alone for just a brief moment um, I feel the res weight and the responsibility of being that go-between between you all and God so today instead of being alone I'm going to invite a group of people up here to be with me so I am not alone and that would be our children our educators and our administrators. Now, let's be very realistic. I know who you are. <laughs> I know what you do. And if you don't carry yourself up here while I'm standing up here, after having said all of that, I am coming to get you. <laughs> so come on. You can do it. Look, there's the leader. Keep going. Keep going. Uh-huh. There's another one. Look how slow they are. That's because parents are going, yep, yep, you're good. That's because parents are going, get up there. Not bad. They're giving you a B to travel. Not bad. So, and I am still not the shortest. <laughs> but I am the widest. <laughs> so, um, Every year we like to acknowledge this group of people for the work that they do, the work they're going to do, and we want to send them off into this next with a blessing. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to give them a gift so they can always remember who to rely on and whose they are. We have these beautiful crosses that they can attach to backpacks or tees or whatever else that you want to. Take one, please, and pass it along. Will you take one of those and pass it along? And we have a little prayer card that goes along with it. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Be not dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with you wherever you go. So this is a reminder to y'all. Take one of these. This is where we go. This is what you have to do probably next week on Monday. Take one and pass. The teachers are going to take one and pass. Okay. Here we go. Does everybody have a cross? Yes. Good. Y'all are just going to have to pretend that we had enough for you, too. There's one for you. We'll get to that later. All right. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you all to pray with me, and especially as we pray, please keep this group of people in your minds as well as all of the other students and educators and administrators 
who are beginning tomorrow. I invite you to go to God in prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, today we give thanks for this body of believers gathered in your name. With dawn each day, we have a clean slate, refreshed spirit and mind, a new beginning. At the beginning of this school year, we give our children, educators, and administrators to you. Keep them safe and protected. We ask that you would use every person, every experience, and every lesson to shape them into your image, to grow them in your spirit and to your heart. Where our feet bind us and them, may it be a place where we love to learn and learn to love, a place where everyone is respected and deeply valued. Fill our hearts with excitement and calm their worries with your love. Help them build new relationships full of promise. Help us all to make wise decisions that lead to positive outcomes. Give us patience and perseverance so that we can remain focused on your call. May we be reminded of the importance of building one another up rather than tearing one another down. Introduce us all to the beauty of diversity with instilling values of integrity, hard work, and an inner fire within to reach higher and aim for you. We ask all of this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Go forth and do good work. Thank you all. And do keep them in your hearts and minds in the next few weeks. This is the you get to do part. You get to share what God gave you by tithing, sharing what treasure you have in those baskets which allows the church to go where? Out there. And reach people in places and situations that you may never, ever know they've reached. You can light a candle to remind you that nothing ever, ever, ever is going to leave you alone. No one will ever leave you alone because Jesus and the light will always be there. And if you have a burden, if you have a concern, or you have a thanksgiving, write it down. Hang it on that cross. He can hold it for you. And then finally, all are welcome at this table, and that one, and that one. This is Jesus' table. Come and be fed. I invite Debbie forward for the words of institution. And on that night so long ago, Jesus uh, gathered in, in a room, that upper room, uh, with his friends and his disciples. And he, after the dinner, he uh, took a loaf of bread. He blessed it and broke it. He said, this is my body given for you. And likewise, he took a cup full of wine, blessed it, and said, this is my blood shed for you. And do it all in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Please come to the table.
Sometimes I become acutely aware that I have a lot to learn still. I came in the back of our worship space this morning and I was cutting up. I, I didn't mean to, but Alan and I got carried away and I thank God for the mothers in the church because Miriam turned around and said, don't you thank God for the mothers in the church? Some lessons are hard to learn. I've gotten to a place to where I truly welcome opportunities to learn. I get excited about learning new things. I can imagine there would have been a time in my life when I didn't know about the grace of God that accepts us right where we are, but won't leave us where we are. If I'd walked into the back of a worship space and someone had turned around and went, I would have been like, ugh. But it was beautiful. It was perfect. And you were right. I was distracting. You heard me from 20 feet away. I learn painfully sometimes that there is still a lot to learn. I feel in some ways embarrassed to say this because we live in a world of desperate poverty. There are people this morning who don't have enough to eat in this community. And so what I'm getting ready to tell you embarrasses me a little bit. These are the kinds of things that concern me as a follower of Jesus occasionally. And I keep them at bay like we all do because it would be difficult when we think about the real cost of following Jesus and if we're more and more committed to that. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you, I, I do, I have a boat and I recognize that that's a luxury. Some of you would laugh that I'd be embarrassed by this boat if you saw this boat. The vinyl is torn and it was in the shop all summer and in this area there was a backlog of boats to get to and it was going to take six to eight weeks and I finally got it back and 
because I don't know anything about anything when it comes to boat and the technology and that kind of thing. I, I bought and installed myself, big mistake, a GPS and sonar depth finder. I did all of it by myself, and it worked most of the time. <laughs> and it would keep, when I would hit some chop, the screen would just go off. And so I would unplug the back and plug it back in, and I did this for probably a year or so, and maybe three or four times at least every time I went out on the boat. And then finally it dawned on me, maybe it's not that cord in the back that's coming loose. There's a power panel. I don't know the word. Some of you know the vocabulary better than I do. This is not my area. There's a power panel inside one of those compartments <laughs> under the console. Is that what you call it? There's a power, and what had happened was the screw was loose, so the power wasn't staying connected. And, so, and I finally figured that out. But what happened was, over time, because I had unplugged it and plugged it so many times, those wires were coming loose. So I got my boat back about a week and a half or so ago, and all of a sudden I couldn't use my GPS and sonar. And I realized that cord had been broken, so I ordered a cord, and I installed the new cord, and it powered right up. No, it didn't. And so I started doing all the troubleshooting and going to YouTube. And in desperation, I ran into Seth at Walmart. And my favorite store, someone called me and I said, I'm sorry I missed your call. I was at my favorite place on the planet. This person said, in, on the water? I said, no, I was in Walmart. <laughs> How many of you just love to go to Walmart? Isn't that fun? Somebody said, yeah, well, it isn't for me. But I needed, and I didn't know where to go, I needed a, a, one of those things that checks the voltage. And the only one they had, the, they were sold out of the less, I mean, the one I got was $25, which was $25 more than I wanted to spend. But they had a cheaper one for 16 But the one for 25 was more complicated than I needed it to be. Lo and behold, I checked the voltage here and there and here and there and here and there. And that was the issue. And I traced it back and traced it back and traced it back. And finally, it was this last wire that had gotten weak. It needed to be, in order for that, for it to power up this thing, it has to be over 12 volts, and it was only getting 7 volts, and I followed it all the way back to that last wire and figured out it was that last wire, and after that, as I followed it back, it was getting the 12 volts where it needed to be, and I held my breath, and I pushed the power button, and guess what happened? It worked! <laughs> Aren't you glad when things work out the way they're supposed to? But I tell you, it was, it was trouble. But it, I got to thinking about something. Jesus said, abide in me and my love. He was encouraging us. He was exhorting us. He was instructing us as he was instructing those initial followers. He says, abide in me, abide in my love. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not abide in my love, you can do nothing that will produce joy, peace, kindness, harmony, community. Abide in me. I was thinking about that wire that had gotten frayed, and I was thinking about how there are times when if we're not intentional, our connection isn't what it needs to be. It's not as strong as it needs to be. And therefore, we can't function. We can't thrive. We can't live the way that God desires for our sakes and for the sakes of those around us to live. The disciples had been with Jesus going on three years in our lectionary passage today. There had been others who had been devoted people of God 
probably for their entire lives, and they still had a lot to learn. How many of you know that we all still have so much to learn when it comes to the matters of God? What I love about this journey is the more I learn, the more I want to learn. The more I know, the more I want to know. So let us open our hearts, our minds, our spirits. Let us invite God to instruct us this morning with how God will instruct us. Then the Pharisees and the scribes, those who were devout religious people, came to Jesus from Jerusalem. Jesus and his disciples had just crossed over and landed in Gennesaret. And from me looking at these maps, this is some 65 miles or more. What in the world was Jesus up to that they would travel 65 miles or more? It must have been something really important. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. Can you imagine traveling 65 miles to ask Jesus this question? Why don't your disciples wash their hands before they eat? He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God? For the sake of your tradition. For the sake of what's familiar to you. For the sake of what's been passed down now for generations. This tradition that started when you were in a pluralistic environment for the first time so that you could distinguish yourselves between who is in and who is out by some of these rituals that you practice your dietary laws there are some things you'll eat there are some things you won't eat and people will recognize you by some of these things that you do And you are the chosen people of God. That's what had been passed down to them from their elders. And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and your mother. And whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that whoever tells father or mother, whatever support you might have had from me is given to God then that person need not honor the father or the mother. So, for the sake of your tradition, you make void the word of God. You hypocrites. I said that a little more nicely than Matthew did. There was an exclamation point there, wasn't it? You hypocrites! Isaiah prophesied rightly about you when he said, the people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. It is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Wow. What is it that's coming out of our mouths? What is it that we're saying? Do our words bring life to people? Do our words build people up? Do our words reflect the word of God, the character of God? Do our words bring life or do they diminish life? It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached him and said, Do you not know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? How many of you know that there are sometimes that speaking words of love are not inherently offensive? 
There's nothing inherently offensive about them. They're words of love. But when people don't love the ones you love, sometimes they'll take offense to that. Have you ever noticed that? There's nothing inherently offensive or divisive about loving someone. Nothing inherently. But sometimes it unearths a division that already exists when someone does not love the ones you love. And it can be offensive. Then Jesus said, are you still without understanding? I am. I don't understand all the things of God, do you? I'm still without understanding in a lot of ways. Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out in the sewer, but whatever comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart? If you want to know the condition of your heart, pay attention to your words. What is my heart condition today? Am I speaking words of love? Am I speaking words that have the potential to bring us together? Am I speaking words? It's a strong word. Are they words of division? Are they words of hate? What's in my heart? Lord, my God, Jesus, my Savior, please transform my heart into a heart like yours. Where there is meanness, where there is hate, place kindness and love. For out of the heart co come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands, that's not what defiles. May our lives be transformed by the reading, hearing, understanding and internalizing of these words. I thank God for people of wisdom within and beyond communities of faith. Some of you have heard of Brene Brown, and she's an influencer and has gained some popularity, and I, I don't know a, a lot of what it is that she shares, but she pointed out the difference between Belonging and fitting in. She says, belonging and fitting in are opposites. When we fit in, we have to change who we are so that we can be a part of a community. That way we can fit in. But a community of belonging is one in which no one has to change who they are in order to fit in. I was very fortunate to have a lot of childhood experiences and I learned how to fit in on a regular basis. I showed some of you the picture of one of my young childhood houses, but I didn't go to school with the kids in that neighborhood, I went to another school and the school that I went to, those kids had known each other since preschool, and I didn't quite fit in, and I learned what that felt like. By the time I was in third grade, I had a skin condition already in third grade, where I was beginning, beginning to have blemishes. Back then, kids called them zits. But these weren't just the normal 
blemishes, pimples, zits. It was a cyst-like thing, and it came from within. It wasn't from without. It, was, it had nothing to do with dirt or anything like that. But there was a stigma attached to it. And I can remember a teacher called me to the side, well-meaning, but said it loud enough where other kids could hear it. This was now in fifth grade where it was starting to get really bad. And she said, you're going to have to start cleaning your face better than you're cleaning it because it's going to get out of control. And so I had a skin condition that made people think I was dirty. And there was nothing I could do about it. There was no amount of washing that was going to fix it. I still have scars along the side of my jawbone here, and there are some scars on my back. I was fortunate that my mother made a lot of sacrifices, but it was one of those things that because of the way people saw me, it was one of those things where you could tell where folks weren't looking at me. You know what I mean? They were looking at those places on me. My mother made sacrifices, and it cost $600 a month. And this was over 30 years ago for this particular medication that works for some people and not for others, and it worked for me. And I remember how much my life changed by the way people treated me after my complexion changed. I was in the friend zone with all the girls when my complexion was the, you know what the friend zone is, right? Everybody wants to be your friend, but nobody wants to go out with you. It's interesting though, isn't it? That stigma. The same person, but I had that complexion. They had a stigma associated with it. I read an article this week in the New Yorker magazine, and it was talking about implicit bias. And it was saying that many of us have these unfounded, baseless convictions about things, and that we have this high confidence about things that we think we understand. Like toilets, for instance. They ask people, on a scale of 1 to 10, how well do you understand how toilets work? And people rank themselves pretty high. Then they ask them to write an explanation in detail about how a toilet works. And they realize they didn't really understand how a toilet works. I imagine that many people, if we were to take any particular issue about our faith and ask somebody about their convictions about it, they would have strong convictions about it. And then they would say, because the Bible says. And then if we were to say, okay, sit down and write out a detailed explanation about how you came to that conclusion, people might have a hard time doing that. But this confirmation bias. So what happens, they realized, after doing studies at Stanford and Yale, they would get a group of people together. And they would come to realize that even though there was a position that was baseless, if someone else shared that opinion, serotonin is released. It feels good. Now what I thought, it was baseless, mind you. Someone else believes it. And now it's confirmed. And now because Judy and I share this baseless conviction, Pat has overheard it. And now she shares this conviction. And now other people share this conviction. And now it's reinforced over and over and over and over again. And the whole time it was baseless. But it feels good. Because I believe it and you 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 believe it and we all believe it. So it must be true, right? Just like it's God's will 
that they should have washed their hands before they ate. And Jesus says, you nullify the word of God for your baseless traditions. And it's been passed on now from generation to generation, and you've decided who's in and who's out based on this baseless tradition. You nullify the commandment of God. You worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. If you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandment. My commandment is this, that you love one another as I have loved you unconditionally, sacrificially. This is my prayer for me, for me. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, who needs to receive this message. It's not somebody else. This is not one of those moments where I'm thinking, I wish so-and-so was here to hear that. Have you ever had that impulse? Somebody needed to hear that. No, it's me, I. I need to hear this. Lord, I'm still in process. I'm still learning. Teach me to love you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Teach me to love my neighbors as myself. Teach me to follow your message in the Sermon on the Mount. to love even my perceived enemies, to pray for those who despitefully use me. Teach me to love as you love. Let that be my highest form of worship. That is my prayer for me. It's up to you if it's your prayer for you. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able. It's simple, but it isn't easy. It is simple, but it's the hardest thing at times we will ever do. The way of Jesus comes down to this, to love as Jesus loves. It's one sentence, really. That's what discipleship is. That's what faith is. That's what worship is. I am going to renew my commitment to growing, to learning, to be a follower of Jesus. I invite you to do the same as we sing our song of commitment. There is grace in the rise and fall As we turn for everything we've lost There will be moments when the beauty is gone There's a power when we've lost it all As a place where redemption cries As a death that can save a life There's resurrection where there was a cross There's a power when we've lost it all There's a power when we've lost it all
afraid of every crooked turn With sorrow plants in the graves and dirt Jesus uses all the pain in her There's a power in the way he works oh, There's a power in the way he works now may the peace of God that surpasses our understanding, the peace of God that surpasses our ability to comprehend it, the peace of God that will rest in our spirits when we love as God loves, the peace of God that will be experienced on earth as it is in heaven as we love as God loves. May that peace guard and sustain our hearts, our minds, our spirits this day and forevermore. Amen. Hallelujah for a broken heart.